OK. So yeah, so I was saying, I'm going to start by giving a very general overview of what is the homotopy hypothesis. But Simona Pauli already talked a lot about that yesterday, so I'll, go, I'll be quick on this. And then I want to uh, explain what's Grothendieck uh, version of the homotopy hypothesis. It's a precise technical statement that he formulated in pushing stacks. So that part of the talk is going to be a little bit more technical. And then I want to talk about uh, what the statement, what why this statement would be interesting today, and also what progress we have been we have been making toward proving it uh, in the last almost more than forty years now. Uh, and so I'll talk a little bit about work by different people, including myself, uh, toward proving uh, Grothendieck formulation of the homotopy hypothesis. Um, maybe I should start by saying that the title of my talk is completely um, anachronistic. Uh, the term homotopy hypothesis uh, was, I think, introduced by uh, John Baez in the, in the 90s. Uh, and Grothendieck never used it, at least not, uh, not in his writings. Uh, but that's how everybody calls that problem today. So that's how I'm going to refer to it. Uh, OK, so as I said, uh, I'm going to say something that uh, Simona already talked about yesterday. Um, so if you have a topological space X, uh, you can define something called its fundamental groupoid, which is a, so it's a groupoid uh, whose object are the point of X and the morphism are continuous path in X, or more precisely, homotopy classes of continuous paths in X. So we identify two paths if they can be deformed into one another. Uh, and then it's an old theorem of topology. I mean, it goes back to, I think, Poincaré, uh, that the pi one, this construction of the fundamental groupoid, which I'm writing pi one, uh, allow you to construct an equivalence of category uh, between the category of groupoids uh, with isomorphism class of functor as morphism and the category of what I'm going to call one truncated space uh, with homotopy class of map between them. So I should clarify, uh, by space, I only mean nice space. So for example, CW complex. And one truncated means that all the, uh, all the homotopy group for I bigger than one are trivial. So that's, why, uh, that's what uh, Simona called one type, I think, yesterday. Uh, right, and so this this. We have this identification between space that are one truncated and groupoid uh, through that uh, fundamental groupoid construction. And there was also a version of this for uh, two groupoid, which was known relatively early. Uh, so I'm attributing that to Whitehead in 1949. Obviously, Whitehead didn't talk about two groupoid, nor he talked about equivalence of category. But we can track, track that result back to a paper of Whitehead in uh, 1941 that essentially proves the core uh, technical result that we need to, to prove that theorem. And you can show that there is an equivalence of category between two truncated spaces, so space where pi 3, pi 4, and so on are all trivial, and uh, the category of strict two groupoid, uh, with again isomorphism class of functor between them, and for space you take homotopy class of map uh, between them. So the homotopy hypothesis in general is an attempt to generalize that to bigger uh, bigger classes of space, basically all spaces ideally. So you should have uh, a correspondence between the category of n truncated space, meaning space with uh, where pi n plus one and so on are all trivial, and some notion of n groupoids. Uh, and you know, taking n uh, to infinity, we should hope that there is a correspondence between arbitrary spaces and infinity groupoids. Um, so Grothendieck was very interested in this question in the early 80s, and he wrote a whole manuscript uh, about that called Pushing Stacks. Uh, so as far as I know, he's the first one to explicitly suggest this, or at least to write about it. Though, I mean, it's not. I, mean, I think the idea was already a little bit around among topologists. Um, but yeah, at least, I mean, this is the oldest written tra trace I can find about this problem. So. Um, so maybe to clarify uh, a little bit how this, uh, this should work. Um, so we should have like a, some sort of fundamental infinity groupoid construction of a space X. So the object of that potential infinity groupoid should be the point of X. And then as arrow, we should have all continuous path of X. We no longer take homotopy class because now the homotopy are the two arrow of our groupoid. The two arrow should be uh, the homotopy between paths that preserve uh, the endpoint of the path. And marginally, the free arrow should be 
homotopy between homotopy. So you can you know think of a homotopy as a as a surface uh, between the two uh, the two paths, and you can deform a surface to get a notion of homotopy between homotopy. And you want homotopies that preserve the boundary, meaning you preserve the path uh, that your homotopy is between in the first place. Uh, and marginally, you want that n arrow as a boundary preserving homotopy between n minus one arrows. Uh, and this should be equipped with a lot of like composition operation because you know you want to be able to compose space, path, sorry, and to compose homotopy and to take the inverse of a path and the inverse of a homotopy. So you should have lots of operation on all that. And, and those should make that structure into something we want to call an infinity groupoid. And so that should be the idea of the fundamental infinity groupoid of space. Uh, so it's a generalization of this fundamental groupoid I mentioned earlier. Um, Right, so maybe a point that's going to be important later is that here the, the n arrow in that presentation of the fundamental groupoid are going to be balls of dimension n. Uh, and the source and targets uh, of such a ball are going to be the northern and the southern hemisphere of the ball, which are themselves topologically balls of dimension n minus um, one. So, okay, now the big problem to make this, uh, this statement formal and actually what motivated Grothendieck uh, is what, what's an infinity groupoid. Um, so basically this problem is generally thought of as a, as a test for a possible definition of infinity groupoid. Like we don't know what an infinity groupoid is and we're going to propose definition of infinity groupoid. And a good test if whether our definition is correct or not is to see if we can prove uh, the homotopy hypothesis or not. Uh, and that's why it's called an uh, hypothesis uh, instead of a conjecture or the theorem. And that's clearly the idea that Grothendieck had in mind already in, uh, in pushing stacks. Um, and he doesn't mention it explicitly, but it seems relatively clear that he had in mind the development of a theory of infinity category. Uh, actually, the, the, when he, the stacks in pushing stacks is not the same, the same meaning of the word that uh, what we use today in mathematics. Uh, for Grothendieck, the name stacks was how he called a uh, weak infinity groupoid. Uh, and he mentioned at several times that uh, he wanted to call them like stacks in groupoid or groupoid stacks, uh, which suggests that you know, he had in mind more general kind of stacks that would be the weak infinity category. Um, Okay, so before going into Grothendieck definition, maybe I should uh, say a few things about uh, what we nowadays call strict n category, which were just n category uh, not so long ago. Uh, and at the time, Grothendieck wrote. Uh, the idea is it's very easy to define what's a strict n category. A strict n category is, well, you give an inductive definition, a one category is just an ordinary category. And an n category is a category enriched in n minus one category. So what it means concretely is that it's a category, but for each pair of objects, the set of morphism between them is uh, is promoted to be an n minus one category. So for example, the two category for each object, you have a category of morphism between them. And you expect that the composition operation in addition you know, of being associative and so on uh, should be an n minus one functor uh, from you know, om xy times om yz uh, to on x z. So you should you need to know what's the product of two and minus one category as well uh, wow. to make sense of the definition. And it's so that inductive definition is you know might not sound uh, sound very clear, but it's actually fairly easy to turn that into a very concrete algebraic definition with operation and axiom. Like the I could have flashed the definition. I mean the definition probably would have taken me to slide. I chose not to because it's not very helpful. But we have a very concrete definition with, you know, uh, arrow of all dimension. Uh, is there a problem? No. no. Okay. No. Uh, okay. Uh, so you have like arrow of all dimension. You have a bunch of explicitly defined composition operation on them, and they satisfy equ certain equations. Um, and you, so this is for the definition of n category, and then you can easily define infinity category basically by just taking the limit when n goes to infinity. It's uh, it's very easy to do uh, in the concrete uh, definition with uh, operation and, and equation. Uh, and what I want to call strict infinity groupoid are just strict infinity category where each arrow in each dimension has an inverse, meaning uh, an arrow which when you compose, you get the identity. 
Uh, there is actually two versions of that. You can either ask that uh, the composition with the inverse is equal to the identity or is uh, isomorphic to the identity, where isomorphic means to up to a higher cell. Uh, so you get two non-equivalent uh, notion of strict infinity groupoid, depending on how strict you want your inverse to be. All right. Uh, but unfortunately, those strict infinity groupoid, whatever definition you choose, uh, they are not enough to prove the homotopy hypothesis. Um, so, I mean, the obvious way to see that there's going to be a problem is that uh, when you construct the pi infinity of x, as I mentioned it earlier, uh, the composition operation you define, like composition of pass, homotopy, and so on, they don't quite satisfy what you expect of a strict infinity category. All the axiom, all the equality, the equation you should have are only satisfied up to homotopy. For example, uh, in a in a strict ca strict n category, you would expect composition of cell to be strictly associative, like to, to be associative up to equality. But uh, composition of pass is not associative up to equality. You need like either a reparametrization involved, uh, which are encoded by homotopies. Um, so the obvious definition is definitely not going to be a strict infinity category, though one could hope uh, that a different definition of pi infinity uh, would give a strict uh, infinity category. Actually, I've mentioned it's possible in the, in the case n equal to, um, for the, like the n equal to version of the homotopy hypothesis that I formulated, I use strict to groupoid. And actually, there is a paper published in 91 by Kapranov and Voivodsky that claimed to prove this. Uh, that you can show the homotopy hypothesis using strict infinity groupoid with the weak inverse, uh, with a weak notion of inverse. Uh, but it was shown later that it's actually impossible and their, their proof was incorrect. Uh, and it's impossible already for n equal three. Uh, there's no way to represent all three type uh, using strict infinity groupoid. Um, so, okay, so the question is going to be to find a definition of infinity groupoid and to prove uh, the homotopy hypothesis for that definition. So, and the thing is, there are definitions of infinity groupoid for which the homotopy hypothesis is well known. It's not necessarily trivial. I mean, you could take, for example, say that, okay, an infinity groupoid is just a space and then the definition is trivial, but you haven't done anything. Uh, but there are non-trivial definitions for which uh, we already knew the the homotopy hypothesis before the work of Grothendieck. For example, uh, the most generally accepted point of view nowadays is that an infinity groupoid is what we call a can complex, uh, meaning a simplicial set that satisfies certain lifting condition. Um, and that this pi infinity functor is the, the simplicial nerve or, or singular, uh, the singular nerve functor. Uh, and so I'm not going to go into the detail of that because that's not the, the object of the talk, but that corresponds to the idea of representing higher cell uh, not using globes, as I did uh, earlier, but using simplices. So basically, in this kind of infinity groupoid, you would have object, point, you would have arrows, but then the two cells would not be between two arrows, but between the composite of two arrows and a third arrow. And then the three cell would be like fillers for this kind of, uh, of tetrahedron, uh, so uh, dimension-free simplex, uh, where like, so I haven't drawn all the faces because the picture would become unreadable, but basically each face is a two cell and then you can, can compose two of them on one side and two of them on the other. And uh, the free cell is between those two composites and so on and so on. The N cell would be some kind of N simplex. And like with this definition of infinity group OA, the homotopy hypothesis has been known uh, since the work of Kahn in the fifties. Uh, maybe maybe we, should, we need a little bit of the work of Quillen on mold category to really make it formal, but it, it's mostly from the work of Kahn in the fifties. Like we already, knew for a long time that uh, homotopy type, uh, the homotopy type of the space is completely encoded in the in the associated can complex. Okay, but the thing is Grothendieck did not like, did not like the idea of taking can complex as definition of, of infinity groupoid. He explicitly uh, say so in, in pushing stacks. Uh, he, he wanted a definition more in line with the way I presented thing earlier, which is also the way he, he thought about the problem. Um, so he wanted the, the end cell to look like globes because this is how category theory usually proceed. Um, and so he proposed his own definition. Uh, so that's what I'm going to explain now. Uh, so basically it's something that he, he worked on for, I think, I, in proofing stacks, I think he said he sat down for an afternoon and worked out a definition. Uh, he clearly had thought a little bit about it before because before that he already gave some idea of how the definition should work. but. Yeah, he basically just 
worked on his own for some time and came up with the definition and proposed a concrete version of the homotopy hypothesis. So that's where, that's a part of the talk that's going to become a little bit technical. Uh, so we start with the notion of what, uh, what we call a globular set. And uh, so it's a, it's a collection of sets, x0, x1, and so on, which correspond morally to uh, the set of like zero cells, so zero arrow, so object. x1 is a set of one arrow, ordinary arrow, and then x2 is a set of two arrows. x3 is a set of three dimensional arrow, and so on. So you have map between those sets that, for example, if I have a two arrow, I can get its source and its targets, uh, which are uh, one arrow. Uh, can you see my uh, mouse pointer, by the way? I'm using it, but yeah. yes. Yes, okay. Uh, and so those source and target maps should satisfy some relation, which basically say that if you start from a two arrow, uh, the source and target should be like parallel uh, one arrow, meaning they have themselves the same source and the same source object and target object. Uh, so that's what those, those two relation below uh, says. So basically a globular set is the idea of a higher graph. Uh, it has object, one arrow, two arrow, uh, one arrow between object, and more generally, n arrow between parallel n minus one arrow, but it's only a graph. There is no composition operation. Uh, so that's what a globular set is. And so Grothendieck wanted a definition of infinity groupoid, which would be a globular set equipped with composition operation. So what it, in order to do that, like to express what kind of composition uh, <coughs> operation we want exactly is First, constructing, defining a category of like admissible uh, diagrams, uh, which are the, the kind of diagram you want to be able to compose. Uh, okay, maybe I should say at this point that I'm actually presenting a modification of Grothendieck definition, which is due to Malsignotis. Uh, Grothendieck definition uses a slightly different notion of admissible diagram, but nobody ever used it since. Uh, so I'm going to only present the more uh, modern version of the category of diagram. So this category of diagram, both in Grothendieck and Malsignotis presentation, are constructed as full subcategory of the category of globular set. And I'm just going to explain what they look like. So in dimension zero, you only have one, uh, one diagram. It's a, the thing with only one point. So it's, you have one cell in dimension zero and, and nothing else. In dimension one, you want basically a string of composable arrows. So you have the first one is you have two objects with one arrow between them. And then you have like n plus one object with n arrow all in the same direction uh, between them. So those are like the, the same as the object of the of the category delta or simply so set. Um, okay, and then in dimension two, you get a lot more stuff. So you have the simplest one would be you have two objects, two arrow and one two cell between them. And then you can have uh, two composable, vertically composable two cell like this. And more generally, you could have a string of n composable uh, ver uh, vertically composable two cell, but you can also put them uh, horizontally, like you can compose horizontally two cell, and so you can have two like this, or you can have a string of n. And more generally, you want diagrams that mixes the two. So they look like something like this. You have a various, uh, you have a horizontal string of vertical string of two cell. And so this is for dimension two. And higher dimension uh, kind of look like the same. So I haven't drawn the picture because it would be unreadable on the screen. But for example, in dimension three, you would replace each, each of those uh, vertical two cell by a string uh, of, uh, of three cell. Uh, like uh, you would have n plus one, two cell with uh, n uh, three cell uh, between them. So this is our diagram. And so maybe I should clarify what I'm drawing here are like graphical representation of globular set. So for example, if I look at this one, it means I have one element of x2. It has, there is two elements of x1, which are its source and its target. And then there are two elements of x0, which are the source and target of those two elements uh, in x1. And here, same thing. I have a one, two, three, uh, six different elements of x2, and so on, and so on. So OK, we're going to call C the category of this diagram. And again, it's a, seen as a subcategory of globular sets. So the morphism or the map that just sends the, the two cell to the two cell the, and compatible to the source and target. Um, so that's what nowadays people call theta 0, but Grotendieck called it C. So I'm going to use uh, Grotendieck notation here. Um, and so the idea is that if I have another globular set x and k is one of those special diagrams, this object of C, I can define x of k as a set of map from, x, from k to x, a globular map. 
So that's the set of way to like evaluate uh, or label, maybe I should say to label the set, uh, the cell of K as cell of X in a consistent way. So like, for example, if I come back here, uh, I would choose like for each two arrow here, I would choose a two cell of X. For each one arrow, I would choose a, choose a one cell of X and for each point, a zero cell of X. And that should be compatible with the source and target uh, in X. Um, and this way you can actually identify a globular set with certain special pre-shift on the category C. Uh, this is obviously functorial, so this gives you a pre-shift on C. And you can easily characterize which globular set uh, come from, uh, which, sorry, which pre-shift on C come from a globular set. Uh, they can be characterized using certain gluing condition, like a little bit like the Seagull condition, if, uh, if that's something you know. Um, and so the idea of Grotendieck is that it's going to construct a new category, uh, which he calls C infinity, uh, which as the same object of C, there is a bijective on object functor from C to C infinity. So like C infinity has the same object, but more morphism. And an infinity groupoid that should be, so it should be a globular set with some structure. So it should be a globular set, which I think of as a pre-shift on C, so a special pre-shift on C, uh, which can be extended to that category C infinity. And so the arrow of that category C infinity are going to encode all those composition operation we should have on an infinity groupoid. Uh, uh, right, so that's what I just said. Um, yeah, so sorry, I should clarify something. Uh, the, Especially the, the arrow whose domain is a, is a globe, it's just a globe that corresponds to composition operation. And more general arrow in C infinity are like uh, you go from one diagram to another by partially composing uh, the diagram only. So, like the real composition operation are the arrow whose domain is just a globe. Right. So, okay, how does he construct this, uh, this C infinity? So, he, he do uh, basically constructing, constructing it by induction. Uh, so he has a series of, uh, of categories. So he starts with uh, C0, which is just C, and then he's going to embed it in a category C1, and then C2, and so on, up to C infinity. All those categories have the same object, but they have more and more operation, more and more hours. Uh, he actually called the arrow of C1 like the primary operation, and the arrow of C2 the secondary operation, and more generally, the, the arrow of Cn are like uh, operation of like order n. Uh, not sure if, if you use the word order, I don't remember. Um, so those category CI are uh, generated by so some sort of induction principle. And the idea is that CI is freely generated from CI minus one by two things. The first thing is that the functor C to CI should preserve certain push out, uh, which correspond to the gluing of diagram together. Like you want to be able to compose uh, those diagrams, those correspond to certain push out. Uh, in the category C0, and you want those push out to be preserved uh, by the functor to CI. And the other one, which is a really important one, and so I'm going to say what it is, and then I'm uh, going <coughs> some example. Uh, you want that every time uh, you have a pair of arrows. So what I'm calling DN, I've used the notation before, but I haven't explained it. Uh, what I'm calling DN is like the N globe. So it's the globular set that has only one cell in dimension N. Uh, and then as two cell in each dimension below that, which are just the source and target of that uh, top N cell in dimension N. So for each pair of arrow from DN to any object X uh, in CI minus one, if the restriction of those two cell to the, to the two uh, inclusion of DN minus one into DN are equal, uh, then you should be able to find an arrow from DN plus one to X uh, whose restriction to dn are uh, respectively f and g. There are two restrictions every time you have two map from, from dn to dn plus one. So you have the, the restriction along the source map and the target map. Uh, okay, so this uh, might not sound uh, completely clear what it means. So I'm going to give some example uh, on the next slide, I think. Uh, but I should immediately clarify that that construction depends on some choice. Uh, because, for example, you could decide that, okay, if I have a pair of arrow in CI minus one, but I can already find an arrow H that has these properties and I don't need to add one freely to CI, or maybe uh, in the construction of CI, I've already had some arrow that let me construct such filler. So 
so that you don't need to add an arrow H for each pair FG. You only want that in CI, every such pair FG that is in CI minus one uh, admits such a, such a, I would call it a filler. So there are some choice involved at each stage, uh, but the idea is that the, all the theorem we prove and so on should not depend uh, on, the cho on those choice in an important way. But it's still important to uh, point out that there is not a single definition of Grotendieck infinity groupoid. Uh, there is like a whole family of, deep, uh, of definition depending on choice you make uh, at each level of the construction. Uh, but they are like, uh, I don't want to call them canonical, but they are like standard choice uh, you can make if you want. Uh, so let's consider, let's look at some arrow in C infinity to see how it works. So let's, that correspond to some operation on, on certain on operation you should have on an infinity groupoid. So for example, uh, I can, in C0, I can consider two map from D0. So D0 is just a point. And A2, what I call A2 is going to be this, uh, this diagram where I have three objects and two arrow. And I can send the unique object of D0 either to the first point or to the rightmost uh, point in A2. And so this is one case where I have two maps from a globe to another diagram. So here there is no source and target condition because it's D0. And so it means that in the next stage, so in C1, there should be a map uh, that goes from D1, so just one arrow, to this diagram uh, A2, and which when you restrict it to one of the two objects, the first one goes to the first object, and the last one goes to the rightmost uh, object. That's what I mean by preserving the endpoint uh, here. And so, in terms of in terms of infinity groupoid, that should encode an operation. So the infinity groupoid are pre-shift on that category. So the operation goes the other way, and so it's an operation that takes two composable arrow and sends an arrow that goes from the first object to the last one. And so that should encode the composition of one cell, or at least it's an operation that has the same behavior as the composition of one cell. Okay, now using that map, I can construct in C1 two different maps from D1 to A3 that correspond to the two different way of bracketing the composition. Like if I think of that in terms of operation, I can take the operation that first compose the first two arrow and then the third one, or the other one that first compose those two and then the third one. So that's gonna give me two different morphism uh, in the category C1 that go from this one arrow to this diagram A3. And they have the same source and target because both of those arrows and the preserve the endpoint of the total diagram. And so, in C2, I'm going to obtain a map from D2 to A3. So D2 is uh, the, the sphere, uh, sorry, the, the disk. Um, and so A3 is this uh, string of free arrow. Uh, and that corresponds to the operation, which to each triplet of composable cell associate the associativity to cell that witness that the two different way of composing the free cell are the same. Uh, and we can do a lot of, uh, of other things like that. So I'm, I have a few more examples I'm just going to go over briefly. For example, uh, going back to C0, I can consider like twice the identity map from D0 to D0. And this produces in C1 a map from D1 to D0 that gives an operation that send each object X to an arrow from X to X. And that's basically what we want to be the identity. Um, or I can consider in C0 two map from the two map from D0 to D1. So the two map from just one point to one arrow, and this is the two endpoint, but I'm putting them in the wrong order. Uh, I'm putting the target as the first one and the source as the second one. And so this is gonna produce in C1, an arrow from D1 to D1 that turn uh, an arrow X to Y into an arrow Y to X, and that should be the inverse. And then um, you can construct in C2, uh, you can construct uh, arrow with domain D2 that are, that are getting in, uh, interpreted as uh, the two cell that witness that uh, the composite of an arrow with what I call its inverse of the cell you get this way uh, is, uh, is equivalent to the identity uh, or that the composite of an arrow with the identity is equivalent to zero. By equivalent, I just mean there is a two cell between them. So I haven't gotten further than T2 because then the example became more and more complicated, but that's a general idea of how all this, uh, all this is going to work. Okay, uh, so unfortunately that's not quite the end of the story. That was just uh, the definition of infinity groupoid. 
so in, again, infinity group operators are pre shift on that category. C infinity is that when you restrict them to C0, you get a globular set. Um, so the next step is in order to you know, make sense of the homotopy hypothesis, you need to explain which is this fundamental infinity group operator functor. Uh, and so in order to do that, Grotten did construct a, what I want to call a geometric realization. By that, I just mean a functor from this category C infinity of this category of diagram to the category of space. Uh, so that functor should send each object K to the obvious uh, geometric realization. Like, I mean, the, you know, the picture I was drawing earlier, you can think of them as just uh, as this topolog topological space. Like, you know, they are sphere and globe glued on each other. Um, so, but then you need to define, you know, how this functor is going to act on all the morphism of say infinity, and you define that by induction, and it's fairly easy. Uh, basically, uh, you know, on C0, it's very, you can give an explicit definition for the, just the inclusion of diagram. And then the key point of the inductive construction is that all, all those uh, realization of diagram are going to be contractible space. Uh, they are all homotopy equivalent to a point. So basically, every time you have like two arrow that take value uh, in one of the space, you can always find an homotopy uh, between them. And that's how you construct this uh, higher cell by this, uh, not higher, but this new cell you had at each step, because those cell can be thought of as homotopy between previously existing arrow. And all the space are contractible, so you can always find homotopy. So you, again, at each step, you're making a choice, but the theorem we're going to phrase at the end should not, in theory, depend on those choices. Of course, that's uh, something we would have to prove at some point. Um, right, and once you have this geometric realization, it's very easy to define uh, pi infinity. Uh, so if x is a topological space, uh, you can define pi infinity as a pre-shift on C infinity, which is defined by taking continuous map from the realization of a diagram to X. And uh, sorry, and it's very easy to see that it gives you a globular set. And actually, this is a globular set we want. Like the, the zero cell are the point of X, the one cell are the continuous path in X, the two cell are the homotopy between those, component, those continuous paths, and so on and so on. But this is because of this construction, this is extended to a functor on C infinity. And so this is something we want to think of as an infinity group. Oriented. And I should say that in some sense, the fact that we have been able to construct that geometric realization is the proof that in the definition of C infinity, we only have put like reasonable operation that we should have on an infinity groupoid, at least if we believe the homotopy hypothesis is true, uh, because we, have, we are able to construct those operation on the pi infinity, uh, the fundamental infinity groupoid of a space. Okay. Um, so that's not quite the end of the technical part. I, I need to phrase the conjecture, but we have done all the hard stuff now. Um, so it's fairly easy to show that you can define the homotopy group of an infinity groupoid, uh, and you can show that the pi infinity functor, uh, as defined previously, preserves those homotopy group, meaning that uh, the homotopy group of the space X are the same as the homotopy group of its fundamental infinity groupoid. Uh, then you can define weak equivalencies of infinity groupoid as the map that induce bijection on all homotopy group at all base points. Uh, and you can define the homotopy category of infinity groupoid by like formally inverting uh, those weak equivalents. And Grothendieck conjecture, which is what I call Grothendieck's homotopy hypothesis, uh, is that this pi infinity functor induces an equivalence of category between the homotopy category of space and the homotopy category of infinity groupoid. Uh, and yeah, and so that that's the end of uh, of what Grothendieck did, uh, at least with that definition of infinity group. Eight. So this is roughly the first chapter of Porschwing stacks. Uh, in the rest of Porschwing stacks, he tried to develop a uh, a more general, much more general theory of uh, the way he presented. It, it was supposed to be a theory of all possible model for infinity group. Eight. Uh, at the end, he defined a very interesting class of possible model for infinity in groupoid, which unfortunately don't include at all this original definition that he has. And so he never really tried to prove uh, that conjecture uh, as stated here, or at least he doesn't write about it. Um, right. So why do we care about this problem? And I'm going to first explain why we don't really care about this problem. Um, so. The point is Grothendieck infinity groupoids are relatively hard to work with. Uh, 
Uh, and by relatively, I'm being very generous, they are extremely hard to work with. Uh, so we don't really expect this to be useful to study spaces. Like spaces are way much simpler than infinity group. If anything, uh, having the homotopy hypothesis would be a way to study infinity group in terms of spaces. Um, and as I mentioned, there are other versions of the homotopy hypothesis using other definition of infinity groupoids that are already proved. And ah. those definitions have been extended to definition of higher categories. I mean, for example, the definition uh, Simona Paoli talked about uh, yesterday. Uh, and obviously even more common definition like uh, the notion of quasi category for infinity one for which there is a huge uh, literature about. Um, so, that essentially completely circumvents a uh, Grothendieck approach to higher category. Uh, it's kind of realized what Grothendieck wanted to do, but using completely different tool than what he wanted to use uh, in order to do it. Um, so the reason we still care about this problem is that this is basically just a test problem for how easily we are able to understand a uh, higher structure in general. It's like, it's a, it's as far as I'm concerned, it's one of the simplest example of a higher structure, meaning something where you have cell of all dimensions that express like current condition that should work in the sense that it's a very reasonable definition, uh, but somehow we are unable to work with. Uh, I'm gonna mention later example of thing we don't know how to prove with this definition of infinity group that are extremely simple looking. And uh, basically, we don't know how to do anything with Grothendieck, um, very little with Grothendieck definition of infinity groupoid. Uh, and so there are a lot of different ways of weakening the notion of strict infinity category. Uh, several of them have not been shown to be equivalent, and we are somewhat hoping that understanding that example will give us uh, ID on, on more generally how you can not necessarily help to prove other comparison theorem, other specific comparison theorem, but to more generally understand um, how to solve cl bigger class of problem, I would say. This is like, this is one type of problem that we have never been able to solve. Okay, so, uh, so where are we, where are we toward the proofs of this conjecture? What progress have been made? Um, so this is still open, uh, and it is clearly a lot harder than Cotton could have reasonably, uh, anticipated. Um, I think we're getting closer, uh, but definitely we are still not there. It's still a completely open problem. Uh, so I'm gonna go over various things that have been done uh, in the last 40, or more precisely in the last 20 years. Um, so the thing is, uh, Grothny conjecture, so it appeared at the beginning of pushing stacks, which for a long time was just uh, very, uh, was relatively hard to find as a text and was extremely hard to read. Uh, and so the actual precise nature of the conjecture stayed largely unknown for a long time. Uh, when you read the literature up to 2005, 2010, uh, basically people were aware that Grothendieck had work of this problem, but not many people were aware that Grothendieck had a formulation of the homotopy hypothesis. And so actually the first published contribution that is relevant to Grothendieck's formulation of the homotopy hypothesis is uh, Batanin in 98, uh, uh, where he, he, he clearly was aware of, uh, of what Grothendieck was trying to do. And he proposed a definition of weak infinity category. So there was already other definition of uh, weak infinity category around at the time. But the point is that his definition was really much of the same flavor as Grothendieck definition. It's a globular set with a bunch of operation. And so he phrased his own version of the homotopy hypothesis, which is extremely similar to Grothendieck uh, homotopy hypothesis. And actually, I'm going to go over that later, but this version has been proved to be equivalent to Grothendieck conjecture. That's why I'm mentioning it here. Um, and so from that point, there start to be uh, attempts at proving that conjecture. Uh, so in 2001 and 2006, there was two papers by respectively Berger and Szynski that uh, obtained a partial result uh, toward Batten inversion of the conjecture uh, that were extremely promising. I mean, there is a theorem in Szynski's paper, which honestly is basically the homotopy hypothesis. Like you could hope for a slightly better statement, but it's very close uh, to be the homotopy hypothesis. Uh, 
Uh, the problem is that there are mistakes in Berger papers that completely invalidate uh, the result of both paper. Uh, like the, there are theorem in Berger papers that have contrary example, and Cisinski used those theorem, and uh, it's not completely clear what can be say, uh, saved from those paper. Uh, they clearly have extremely interesting approach, extremely interesting methods. Uh, as far as I'm concerned, this is one of the most promising strategy to prove the homotopy hypothesis today. Uh, but yeah, there we cannot directly use what's in the paper, just the general ID and the method that they use. None of the result is uh, is proved. I mean, the because of mistake on previous result in the paper. Uh, but that that's the first like serious attempt at proving uh, Grothendieck formulation of the homotopy hypothesis. I mean, patented formulation. So the next step is in 2007, where Malsignotis published a preprint which completely uh, present Grothendieck's uh, definition of infinity groupoid and the homotopy hypothesis with all its detail as I did before. And I said he slightly modified the definition and what I presented is actually uh, Malsignotis uh, definition. Uh, and in the same paper, he also generalized Grothendieck definition of infinity groupoid to a definition of infinity category. So this is about, uh, you know, in the construction of C infinity, as I explained before, you want to be able to tell which arrow correspond to like composition operation or coherence for those composition operation and which arrow correspond to inverse or coherence for the inverse. And so he refined a little bit the construction to tell the difference between the two. And he's able to construct like a new C infinity that contain only uh, the composition operation. And so, which can lead to a definition, which is leading to a definition of, of infinity category. Uh, and not that long after that, so in 2010, uh, well, the, it was uh, Dimitri Arras PhD thesis. So 2010 is the time it was published. Maybe the results were known before, because you know he worked on that basically for three or four years. Uh, so Ara proved that Batanin uh, definition and the uh, grothendieck malsignotis definition of infinity category are equivalent. Uh, and, and here by equivalent, I mean an actual equivalence of the algebraic structure. So it's an equivalence of, of ordinary category, not, uh, not a hop to, up to a homotopy equivalence like we usually have uh, with this kind of stuff. Uh, the definition really are the same uh, in a very concrete algebraic sense. It's, it doesn't involve any homotopy theory. Um, so in particular, like Batanin uh, formulation of the homotopy hypothesis is, I would say, essentially equivalent to Grothendieck. Uh, there is a little difference in the, how you pass from infinity category to infinity groupoid. So, I mean, someone would at some point need to prove that the two statements are equivalent, but I, uh, nobody has any fear that they are not going to be easily proved equivalent if we one day need to do it. Uh, Okay, so shortly after that, uh, we got the first study of the homotopy theory of infinity groupoid. Uh, basically, you know, if you if you think the homotopy hypothesis uh, is true, uh, you should be able to do homotopy theory in terms of infinity groupoid and using Grothendieck's definition. Uh, so as I said, Grothendieck infinity groupoid are hard to work with, so this is actually fairly difficult. So Aha only did like relatively, I would say basic stuff, basic from the point of view of topology. So basically he proved basic property of homotopy group, like the fact that the homotopy group are actually grouped. Uh, and the fact that, for example, um, homotopy group do, do not depend on base point as soon as the base point are in the same connected component, that kind of stuff. And probably the most relevant, uh, most important result of his paper is that the, the notion of weak equivalent that we defined earlier that, you know, in terms of being a bijection or pi n, that notion satisfies what we call the two out of three uh, property, meaning that, for example, if you have a, a composite uh, Fg of two morphism between infinity groupoid, if the composite is an equivalence and one of them is an equivalent, then the other one is also an equivalence. Uh, and this is actually a very difficult uh, result. As far as I'm concerned, this is the, the most technically uh, difficult result in the topic so far, and it's it's, it's the, what I mean here is that it's the only result uh, about infinity group that really use uh, combinatorics of the definition that really like construct a bunch of operation of infinity group using this inductive definition and show property of those operation and use that to prove the theorem. Uh, all the other proof in the topic use more conceptual argument. And this is the one of the few where you really have to go into difficult technical detail. Um, 
So the next step is a continuation of, uh, of uh, Ara's work. Uh, so it's uh, Lanari who studied the possibility of defining uh, what we call a Quillen moral category of infinity groupoid. So Quillen moral category are like the most commonly used uh, category theoretic uh, model for homotopy theory. So basically it's trying to set up a homotopy theory of infinity groupoid, uh, like basically continuing what uh, Ara started in 2013. And he couldn't quite do that. Uh, so he gave a series of equivalent statements uh, to the existence of this moral structure. Uh, and so if I have time, I don't think, I'm not sure I will have, I will give some of them and they are extremely simple looking. Uh, but he did prove that the moral structure exists for three groupoid and also for one groupoid and two groupoid, but that was much easier. Uh, so he proved that we can build this, uh, this homotopy theory for three groupoids. Uh, and he, he, he does that like by hand using very explicit construction. And that's why he has to stop at three because the complexity uh, increased very quickly uh, with, the, with the dimension. Uh, and so in 2016, so I put it after because uh, in logical order it follow, uh, it was an independent work, uh, but because it was uh, Lanari's PhD thesis, he did the work long before it was actually published as, as his thesis. Uh, so in 2016, I actually gave a proof of the homotopy hypothesis, but assuming something. And basically what I assume is one of the condition uh, that Lanari has in order to set up the Quillen moral category. So essentially I prove that if you can construct this Quillen moral category of infinity groupoid, then you can prove the homotopy hypothesis. Uh, and I'm not completely related, but I'm still mentioning it uh, using the same kind of method. I actually, I also proved that I proved the version of the homotopy hypothesis, but for a different definition of infinity groupoid, uh, which is also something defined as like globular set with composition operation, uh, but not Grothendieck definition. And I need like, a, basically what I'm doing is I'm adding a lot more composition operation uh, to Grothendieck definition in order to, to be able to do that. Uh, and so the final, the most recent progress on the topic is from 2019, where we just, uh, there is not really, I think, many, not many new ideas in that paper, it's just combining uh, previous stuff. So it's a joint work with uh, Lanari, where we prove that uh, this conditional proof of the homotopy hypothesis uh, work, not just for infinity groupoid, but also for n groupoid for any finite n. And so given that Lanari proved that there is a moral structure for three groupoid, uh, we can prove uh, the homotopy hypothesis for free groupoid. Uh, so there is one sense in which this is a nice achievement because this is pretty much the first uh, non-trivial case of Grothendieck's homotopy hypothesis to be proved. But on the other hand, uh, the homotopy hypothesis for free groupoid uh, was known uh, before that. Uh, so for example, I think uh, Simona Paoli has a version of that where so she has a, like a globular definition of free groupoid uh, well, maybe I not. Well, she has a definition of free groupoid that is in category theoretic spirit where she can prove the, uh, the homotopy hypothesis. And I think there was uh, maybe other paper doing that as well. So it's like not a new result in the grand scheme of thing, but it's the first one, the first case of Grothendieck formulation of the homotopy hypothesis. All right, so if I can take a couple more minutes, I want to go a little bit over uh, this condition of, uh, of Lanari. Um, so basically, Quill and Moral Structure are like our best tool to define like well-behaved uh, homotopy theories. Uh, and so Grothendieck already raised the question of defining a, a model category of infinity group in pressure stacks. He actually uh, asked that in his letter to Quillen if, uh, if it's possible to construct a model category of, of infinity group rate. Um, and so we have model structure for like strict infinity group groupoid. It's called the brown golonsky model structure. Uh, we have one for strict infinity category, uh, the Lafon metayer uh, vorekevich I think I'm pronouncing it right, uh, infinity category. Um, and those give a very natural candidate for the model structure on Grothendieck infinity groupoid. Basically, we can like the, those two model structures have essentially the same class of, of, uh, of maps. So model structure is the data of three classes of maps satisfying some axiom. And we can say what those three classes of maps should be for infinity groupoid, like the vibration, co-fibration, weak equivalence. Uh, so we have the candidate, we, we know what the model structure should be, but we don't know how to prove that 
this satisfies the axiom of a model structure. Uh, and there are two art steps in the proof. Uh, there are two things we don't know how to do. And if we can solve those two things, then the story is over. Uh, the first one, it's actually already done. It's this uh, thing that Ara did in 2013. Uh, weak equivalent satisfy two out of three. And the other one is that push out of the, the map, the source and target map, uh, dn to dn plus one are weak equivalents. And that sounds like it should be very easy. Like, let, let me tell you what it means. It means that if I start from an infinity groupoid, uh, I choose an n-dimensional arrow in it, and I'm going to add another n-dimensional arrow that is parallel to this one, and an n plus one arrow between the two. That's like an isomorphism uh, between the two. Like, I mean, it's an infinity groupoid, so every arrow is an isomorphism. Um, so I'm like freely adding a cell and an isomorphism to a previously existing cell. And the conjecture is that the groupoid I get this way is equivalent, is a homotopy equivalent to the previous one in the sense of this notion of homotopy equivalent that we defined earlier. So this, I mean, this sounds like something that should be fairly easy uh, as soon as you have some theory of infinity groupoid, but that's one of the things that we have not uh, been able to do at all. Uh, so it's still this, this second condition is still open at this point. Uh, and so I'm just finishing with a, a last remark. So uh, Lanari also, also observed uh, that this condition, you can deduce it from the existence of an infinity groupoid of Arrow. By that, I mean, if you start from an infinity groupoid X, you should be able to construct an infinity groupoid uh, P of X, uh, whose objects are like the Arrow of X, the morphism are like the commutative square with a two cell, uh, and so on. Uh, so Lanari gave a precise definition of Px as a globular set, but it is unknown how to make it into an infinity groupoid. And that's how he, he solved the problem in dimension three, uh, where he actually constructed all this composition you, you need for a free groupoid by hand. Uh, but that strategy is unlikely to work. Uh, but I mean, maybe it would be possible for dimension four if someone has a lot of time to, to lose. But clearly, that's not an option for just n equal five or n equal six, and even a computer couldn't do it uh, beyond that. Um, so I think I'm going to stop here because I want to uh, keep a little bit of time for question. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your attention.